right, good morning, Calvary. How are y'all doing today? Good. God is doing some exciting things um, right now, and I just want to share a little bit more to give you a little bit broader perspective. Uh, ultimately, the numbers that matter to most to me are the people who are being baptized and saying, I want to, I've now decided to follow Jesus. And I, last week we had 12, and you saw a little glimpse of that. We have at least three others this week have indicated that they're now ready to start following Jesus. God is moving in our midst. Do you know that last week we had um, as many people in worship, almost as many people in worship that we had Easter, and we had more people in the building than we had at Easter. And so God is just moving in, in mighty ways. Uh, our children's ministry is up like 35%, which leads me to a little point in this crowd. If you have children and you could think, I could come at 10, 15, or I could come at 9, let me urge you to come at 9, because our children's ministry is not in line right now. We have one class that's very full and one that's not. And so if you say, I'm only coming at 10, 15, okay, we're glad you're here. But if anybody could come at 9, it would help us, because this crowd this hour is full, and last week, the 1130 had more people in it than this hour. And so God is just moving, and we're really excited about all that he's doing here. The reason God is moving is because people are coming to this understanding that we're talking about in the Simplicity series. The reason that God is moving is because people are coming to this understanding that you were made with one truth in mind. You were made to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That is the simple truth. That is the premise of this entire series we're in right now. You were made to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And my wife, I quoted her last week, talked about how when we try to simplify our life, the implications are, are difficult, but they're also profound. It is a place in our life where we have to journey and wrestle with what God is asking us to do and how to get us to have this simple focus. How do we have a simple focus? It actually requires more work and our life may become more difficult and a struggle. How do we come to this place where we really grasp the magnitude of this simple truth? This is what we're on today. We're talking about simple priorities. And it's really this understanding of once you grasp this idea that you were made for one purpose, to have a relationship with Christ. And he becomes your one love that dominates all your relationships. In other words, you'll be a better husband. You'll be a better wife. You'll be a better son or daughter. You'll be a better father or mother or worker because you're keeping Christ at the center of your life. Then it has to shape all of your priorities. All of your priorities. Do you ever feel like your life is like a, a ping pong ball being battled back around? You know, it's like you're one moment over here and then spanked it back over across the net to over here. And then like, woo, it's like you're on a roller coaster and, and you're sitting here just guiding your life, trying to find where, where do I stop? Right. Anybody, or is it just me? <laughs> um, but you ever felt like life was kind of chaotic and, and out of control and you're trying to the simplicity series will help you to manage that. Because if we don't come to a place where we have simple priorities, we do the work and the effort to, to simplify what our priorities, here's what's going to happen. Your priorities will be dictated by your schedule, right? And how many of you were really busy yesterday? I was extremely busy yesterday, and it was all great things. It was family activities. It was soccer games. It was a men's prayer breakfast here, bacon. It was all these wonderful things. And so <laughs> we're sitting there going, and it was great, but it was still extremely busy how do we know how to live our life? How do we really get to a place where we say, I'm going to live the simple life and have the simple priorities that comes from that? Here's what I want to ask you this morning. Where is the pain in your life? Where is the pain in your life? Because in absence of following Christ with a simple understanding, what's going to happen is the pain of your life will dictate your priorities. And it's going to dictate your schedule. And I'll explain that in a minute. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one close around you. And feel free to take that as our gift from us to you. Matthew chapter 6. Here's what it says in verse 19. Matthew chapter 6. At first glance, this passage will be, appear to be about money, but... It's really about the last part of this section where it says, Don't collect for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But collect for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor dust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. 
For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of your body. If your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So if the light within you is darkness, how deep is that darkness? No one can be a slave of two masters, since he either will hate one or love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot be the slaves of God and of money. No man can serve two masters. It's really this going back to this understanding that you were made to have one relationship, not two, not half of you in one relationship, you and half of you in another. And this, this simple idea that this is the truth, and that you were made for this simple relationship and should guide you, will dictate whether or not in your life you're living a life that is satisfied and fulfilled. Do you live a life that is satisfied and fulfilled? Whether you're a Christian or wrestling with this concept of could God be real, it doesn't really matter. Do you come to a place in your life where you can say to me, Daniel, I know that my life is fulfilled right now. Not the hope of what is to be fulfilled, but my life, salvation is here. My life is fulfilled now. My life will be fulfilled even more in heaven, but right now I'm content and I'm living a fulfilled life. Can you say that? If not, I want to ask you this question. Where is your treasure? Because if there's a pull between you, between no man serving one God and another thing, whatever that thing is, it's right, likely followed by where your heart is and where your treasure lies so where is your treasure? Uh, not too long ago, about, well, it's been about three years now, my wife and I were doing this different system of finances. I know I, we like all these different financial systems, but the system we were doing at the time was I was paying everything on the credit card bill and paying it off every month so that I could see, because they broke down the percentages of how we were spending things. And I wanted to see how we were spending it, and I was too lazy to get one of those quicken things. And so I, this was my system. And so I was looking through the system and, and realizing it. And at the end of the month, I got my first bill, and I was like, no, that can't be right. So we, we plowed through to the next month, and the next month I got the bill, and I go, oh. And what I realized is where the Barry treasure is was in eating out, okay? And now, I, as much as I like to deny eating out was the treasure of my heart, the, the, the numbers said otherwise. The bills said, you were putting our resources there. Our heart was in eating out. What are we trying to do? Now, hear me, there's nothing wrong with a great Chick-fil-A sandwich with crispy waffle fries dipped ever so slightly in Polynesian sauce, which sounds gross at first until you absorb that into your soul. And then you go and drink a wonderful, this big uh, cookies and cream milkshake, light whipped cream minus the cherry. And it's wonderful. There's nothing quite like that in this world. But what you find is, and what we find is, when your treasure is there, what happens is that's a temporary treasure. It, it dissipates quickly. And you're left longing for more. And in my own life, what I realized was I was living my life in a sense, uh, I know this sounds weird, but in a little scale, I was living my life to eat instead of eating to live. And, and so we all have these pain areas of our life, these places in our life that cause us to run, to fill a void that we have. The void was made for the place and the purpose of having an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. This is where we find truth. But in order to simplify our priorities, we have to identify the painful areas of our life and, and realize why they're causing us pain and where we're retreating to to find pain. Uh, I've been told they're called pill bugs up here, but in Texas, we call them doodle bugs. You know what doodle bugs are? Doodle bugs are these little bugs that when we were little boys, you know, they're, they're, little, they're like billion legs and they curl up in a little ball, you know? Uh, what are, is that pill bugs? Y'all look like lost. Y'all know what those are? Roly polies, thank you. Um, the roly polies, and, and so people walk around, and, and you see, when I was a little boy, we'd collect them and then we'd flick them uh, and see how far they'd roll. And kids don't do that. Um, but it was what we did as boys, and we'd collect them and we'd flick them, and, and, and we loved how you could go touch it, and then their, their defense mechanism was, right? And, and what we find is that's what we do. As much as we, I like to make fun of the roly polies as a little kid or the pill bugs or the doodle bugs or whatever you want to call them. This is our defense mechanism. When life gets hard, we, we run into, we turn into ourself. We turn into our own being, our own understanding to find something to satisfy our soul. 
What is it in your life that you turn to to escape the pain? And when you identify what is the pain in your life and then you realize how you escape into it, you're able to realize that Jesus needs to be the answer to that pain. You need to come to a place where when your priority is shaped in Jesus, what you're going to find is your pain will start to dissipate. And this is really a matter of perspective. But you say, Daniel, I don't even know how to find that right now. How do I identify where my treasure truly lies? It requires introspective, uh, introspection. It requires you looking within yourself, but it also gives us a hint here. It says what? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For the eye is the lamp of your body. If your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So if the light within you is darkness, how deep is that darkness? Do you ever feel like that? Like, I'm supposed to have this light in me, but all I find is this impending and deep and voluminous darkness that I can't seem to escape that I, I, want, I want something to come in and shine through. I want something to come in and change me. I want to find a new me. But all I find is worry and anger and hatred and bitterness and self-doubt that makes me run to food or that makes me run to other areas of my life. And I, I want to argue with you this morning. The reason we go there is because we don't have on the perspective of an eternal lens. You see, this idea of simplifying your priorities really is coming to a place where you have an eternal perspective. What keeps you from having the eternal perspective is the lens in which you see the world, the eye in which you see the world. It says there, there is an evil eye and a good eye. And no man can serve both. You can't serve the evil eye and the good eye. You can't serve evil God, the evil of the world and serve God. And so what you have to do is you have to fill the very part of your being, the very part of your soul with the nature of God. And this shapes everything in your life. I heard a sermon not too long ago by a guy by the name of Matt Chandler, and he was talking about the different things you see in this world, the different the things that your eyes can lead you astray. Let's talk about those for just a moment. The very first one, that your eye might see, it's for, because of the sake of the kids in the room, I'm going to say intimacy, right? Your eye can see the need for intimacy. Why does this need exist? This need exists because you were made to be in relationships. You were made to be in a, a deep and intimate relationship with the Savior of the world, with Jesus, with God. And in absence of that, we, we tend to put our heart affection into something else. And, and if our marriage is struggling or if, if we feel lonely, we're willing to sacrifice what we're supposed to be in hopes to fill a void. The doodlebug effect, the roly-poly effect is to come inside yourself and to temporarily satisfy it in whatever means possible. And so we, we will risk our marriage by having affairs or we will risk everything by looking at a computer screen and we will desire something that is ultimately meant to be filled with the grace of God because our eye sees something that is not in the way it should see it. Now, let me go to the next thing and say, what are we asked to focus on? And really the next thing that our eyes can pick up and our eyes can, can gather in are covetous things. Okay, so I kind of just picked on the men for a little bit. Let's, let's pick on a, a traditionally more topic for women, right? This is the place where you come to the place where you say, oh, look at that pair of shoes, right? If I could have those shoes, I don't get this, right? I will feel complete. And then you wear them and then they rub blisters on your feet. No, seriously, I... What is the point? That's so true. Um, is this place where you come to this realization of what are you looking for in those pair of shoes? And when you're looking for those pair of shoes, are you trying to find a beauty from within your heart? Are you trying to find something to fulfill your longing to feel like a daughter of God, a beautiful daughter of God? Well, there's nothing wrong with a good pair of shoes. There's nothing wrong with a wonderful, intimate marriage. There's nothing wrong with these things. It's just your viewpoint of how you perceive these things. Because you see, your shoes you need. That's what keeps you safe and allows you to walk and keeps you warm in the cold. But there's something in us that says we need more. And so we look into something that isn't the purpose and we make it something that isn't what it's supposed to be. And that was not a very good sentence, but that's okay. We got the concept. 
As we wrestle with this identity of what we're about, it forces us to see what we want to be. How many of you look at vacations with envy? I'm a vacation envier, right? Uh, ever watch the Travel Channel and you're like, why am I watching the Travel Channel? This is not good. And, and all they do is show food and exotic locations. It's like the, the, my kryptonite, okay? And hear me, I'm going to take a vacation with my kids. We're probably going to go to Disney World. Woo, it'll be great. But how often do we spend our lives spending 51 weeks of year saving up and working extra jobs to escape the reality of what we're living in on a day-to-day -day basis? Instead of creating an environment and a world that says, I'm happy with where I am on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you live your life trying to escape something? This is what the I will lead you to. The I will lead you to, they have a better home. They have a, 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 a prettier or handsomer boyfriend. They have everything. That, my eyes say, I am not enough. When you have the perspective of a wrong viewpoint. Another thing it can do, it, it can cause disharmony. Because you can look over at a group of people and, and so deep is this darkness in your soul that when you see other people, you assume they're talking about you. You assume that, that they're maligning you and attacking you. And, and you come to a place where you go, I know what they're saying. And you don't know what they're saying. What they're probably saying is, I know they're talking about me. Because the inward perspective of the soul assumes that other people, you see them and you see them as people who are attacking you. When the reality of it is, what we really need to do is to fill our very soul with the light of Jesus, this simple relationship, this simple understanding that one love, that God loved us so much that he sent his son. And when we live our life with this in our heart, when we live our life with this, what we become is a more confident person that other people don't talk about. We become a, a person that we don't care as much about the perception of others. And we, we don't put our worth in food or in clothes or in money. We put our worth in our dignity which you were made to have in the soul relationship with Jesus Christ. And then all of a sudden, it changes everything. But it comes from training your eye to seeing the world as God intended. How do you do that? How do you come to a place that when you see a daughter of Christ walking across the road, you don't see her as an object, but as a person who is a beautiful creation of God? How do you treat yourself that when you see the shoes or the food on your table as not as God providing for your needs, but as a, how do you treat it where God is providing for your needs instead of seeing it as a, a source of temporary gain? It is really this place where you have to wrap your eyes into the things of God. Let me explain to you that this is not always easy. And you have to ask yourself, how do you see the world because to define your priorities will be defined so much by your eyes, by what you see, and by the core of who you are. And this can be scary because we can live our life going, I'm happy here. I know this. And, and you can live, and, and so often people stay in abusive relationships or they stay in pain because the unknown seems scary and they would rather sit where they are in the misery of their life than to risk something new and unknown. You're not alone. But I want to ask you, do you want to live your life in the pain that you've been living in? Are you willing to see the world anew and to put on a new perspective of God? Let me explain it to you this way. I went to Haiti about two years ago, and what we were doing was we were doing vision clinics, and we were doing water purification. This is a church in Haiti, a very basic church, very basic building, no air conditioning, obviously just cinder block walls, and the Haitians would gather here for weekly services. Well, we were providing eye clinics there because Haitians don't have glasses. In fact, to have glasses in Haiti means you are rich, right? And so we were trying to provide people the ability to see and so that they could show the community around them that God loved them. That's why we're there. So this was my job at the Haitian clinic um, all week. Right there. It was really boring. But, you know, and by the way, if you're wondering about the beard, that's what I grow on mission trips because my wife won't let me grow it here. Um, <laughs> it's true. Um, but so I was sitting there all week and I was doing this and then the college students were doing this. That little instrument is called a focometer. That's Lauren. And, and it's a, a focometer. And what you do is we learn the French Creole words for better or worse. Better or worse, right? And so we would adjust it. And we'd go, they'd go, do you see that chart that I was doing? And they'd go, better or worse. And we learned it in Creole. And we were dreaming about saying those words all night because you did it hour after hour. And here's the problem, okay? 
Many of the Haitians wanted glasses. Why? Because glasses was a sign you were rich, you were wealthy. And so they wanted the status symbol of the, what we wanted to do was to give them glasses so that they could see. So the, the tricky thing is we had a limited number of glasses and couldn't give them to everyone. So the students were asked to play a little sleuth at times and go the wrong way to see if they were just lying, you know, better. Oh, really? It should be worse, you know, kind of thing. And, and the hardest conversation you had to have sometimes was, um, and you had to gear yourself up for it. Guess what? God has given you perfect eyesight. Woo! No, he hasn't. I need glasses. You know, that was the response a lot of times. And so when they had a, a difficult case, they would come to me to help to determine whether or not the person needed glasses. The guy named Jean here. Jean needed glasses, but the girl, when she was working with him, didn't, couldn't decipher that because his eyesight was so poor. And so I started working with him and I started realizing this guy's eyesight is really bad. And so I got the optometrist and she came over and started helping us. And, and, and I saw her start going through that photometer, start going click, 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 it kept going in the same direction, it kept the same direction. At the end of it, we, this young man ended up with the strongest pair of glasses we had. I am not an optometrist and don't know anything about glasses, but if, for those of you, who, I wear them, but that's all I know. But for those of you in the room, his prescription that day was a plus 9.25. And it wasn't, see, some of you got it. And, and it wasn't even strong enough for his actual eyesight. Now, when we gave him those glasses, we expected what we'd find in the Bible where people would, woo, right? Yeah, I can see now. Uh, but what we didn't expect was exactly what, because we were all watching and we knew this was coming. And when he put those glasses on, here was his response. As he was taking in a world he had never seen. The doctor or the, the, the practitioner came and whispered in my ear, do you realize this is the first time he will have ever seen the fingerprints on his finger? And when he walks outside in a minute, it will be the first time in his life that he will know that trees have leaves. He's never been able to see that. His world has been so different. His perspective has been so maligned by his natural eyesight. What he was doing was overwhelming. When he put those glasses on, you know what would have been really easy for him to go? I can't handle this. This is too much of a change, too big of a change. It's easier to live in the world I know than to see all these other realities that I've always ignored. But, but he had to come to a place in his life where he had to say, I'm going to lean in my own eyes or I'm going to put on these corrective lenses and see the world as it was intended to be viewed. I'm going to see the trees. I'm going to see the nuances of life that I've never been able to know before. I couldn't do this on my own, but when I put on the corrective lenses, my perspective changed. My priorities would follow as I began to see the world as God intended it to be made and viewed. This is the challenge of us. We are challenged to come to a place when our own natural eyesight fails because we have sinned and we have fallen short of God. And we have to come to a place where we say, I want to take on the form of Jesus into my life. I want to allow him to be my savior and my Lord. And I want to put on his perspective and let him guide my life. And the overwhelming reaction might be, this is too much of a change. My world is, it's beautiful, but I, I almost can't fathom it. But this is what Christ asks us to do. When we put on him and we, we start viewing things, when our eye becomes no longer bad but good and we start seeing the woman with dignity and we start seeing the shoes as a way to get us from point A to point B and we start seeing people as sons and daughters of God and we have an eternal perspective that we were all made to have one relationship through the lens of Christ. Everything around us melts away. You see, you have a choice today. You have a choice in your heart and in your life to view how you view the world. You have a choice to say, I'm going to be a doodlebug and pull into myself and refuse to look at the world around you. Or you can put the lens of Christ on and see humanity for what it was made to be in a relationship with Christ. You can see all of creation in its beauty and its splendor that God loves you enough to die for you so that you might be restored, so that you might have the lens and the perspective. And it means that you can come to a place where you're willing to Die to yourself so that Christ might live in you. 
You see, death to ourselves is symbolized in that baptized. We're buried in the old way of life and we're raised to new walk in a new life means that we at that point are no longer living for ourselves. We realize that our sight is not good enough and we put on our corrective lens and we now are going to see our world not through our own eyes, but through the eyes of Christ. Are you willing to do that today? If so, then your attitude should be like that we found in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 says this, So if you have been raised with the Messiah, it's another name for Jesus, seek what is above. For where the Messiah is seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on what is above and not on what is on the earth. For you have died. It says, for you have died. And your life is hidden with the Messiah and God. And when the Messiah, who is your life, when the Messiah, who is your life, is revealed, then you will be revealed with him in all glory. Revealed, able to see, able to see the glimpse of the glory and the nature of Christ. You see, I believe that you were made for one reason. The simple truth is you were made to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And this uh, should dominate all your other relationships. He should be the first and foremost of your life, guiding you and guarding you in every step of the way. And I believe that this should shape your priorities. Is it wrong to love soccer? No. Is it wrong to go on vacations? No. Is it wrong to eat good food? No. But when you do so, you do it through the lens of God's provision and God saying, I want you to see the world as I see it and not as an attempt to satisfy a pain and a void in your soul. Let me ask you, and this is a question I ask myself daily. Do you want to stay where you are? Do you want to live there? Or do you want to truly have freedom? And the reality is a lot of times, even those in this room who claim to be followers of Christ, it's easier to stay in the darkness, not knowing what we're missing than to risk putting on and challenging ourselves to have the view of an eternal perspective. The fact that all of us are made for a relationship with Christ. It's easier to hide in the darkness over in the shadows than to come into the light and allow him to permeate your soul and your being so that the lens you see through is Jesus himself. If you want to do it, what you have to do is you have to put your mind on things above, which means you have to die to yourself. And the way we do this, the simple application is this. You have to continue to authentically risk you have to come to a place where you say, I might be more comfortable over here, but I'm going to risk. We've talked about this in the past. Uh, not too long ago, I gave you a 60-day challenge to risk something for the sake of God. How are you doing on it? Have you forgotten about it? Are you willing to risk and, and say for 60 days, I'm going to come to a place where I'm going to die to myself and live and whatever God asked me to do, I'm going to do it. Are you willing? And when you come to this place where you risk whatever that that takes and you say, okay, I'm going to do it. Are you willing to spend the time embracing this intimate relationship for which you were made? Are you in a connect group or a grow group? Are you connected in a small group Bible study? Are, are you going in your relationship daily? Are you in the word daily asking God to show himself and reveal himself to you so that the light in your very soul will illuminate out your eyes so that when you see the world around you, you see the creation of God. Are you tired of living a life of pain and misery? It's going to require you saying, I now want to see the eternal perspective and all my priorities will be focused first and foremost on the relationships I have. Say, so Daniel, that's, that seems too vague. What, all I need to do is spend time with God and be willing to risk? Yes. And if I give you more than that, then I'm becoming the answer to what God's asking you to do because my ultimate purpose in life is not to give you a one, two, three step to come and to find what you need to cure you. My ultimate goal in life is to give you a one, two, three step to point you to the Savior of the world and allow Him to be your lens. You don't need to see the world through the perspective and the lens of a pastor. You need to see the perspective and the lens through Jesus Christ who is alive in you because salvation is here now. So, Simple challenge for the simple series. Are you willing to die to yourself and start seeing the world with dignity? Everyone around you is dignity, needing to know of this simple truth that Jesus saves. Are you willing to go through the pain and the process of changing your worldview to saying, I'm going to die to myself. I'm going to sacrifice and I'm all in for the movement of God. Are you willing to see 
the freedom and the beauty of God's creation in the magnitude in which it was made. If so, let go. Be willing to sacrifice, die to yourself and spend time in intimacy with the savior of the world that you were made to have. We're gonna help you along the way. I'm thankful for what you're here. I'm thankful that God is moving in your life. And if you've never had a relationship with Jesus Christ, here's what it takes. You just gotta die to yourself. You gotta stop being a roly poly. You gotta stop looking inward and you gotta say, I'm gonna let go. I'm gonna say, God, I've messed up. And I'm professing that you are my savior. If you're there, I had to challenge you to write on your connect card that little white thing in your bulletin and say, I want to follow Jesus and let us follow up with you. If you're a Christian in this room and there's something keeping you from fully letting go, that's what the cross is for. Maybe you need to write something on a piece of paper and nail it to the cross with a pin. So say, I'm gonna leave it here. We don't read those, we just tear them up. We pray over them and tear them up. Whatever God is asking you to do, would you let go? Because here's the reality. God is moving here. And we can have huge numbers, but if you don't respond to God, you will miss out. It is a personal God. It is a simple identity. It is a simple relationship that your spouse can't do for you, that your parents can't do for you, that your children can't do for you. You have to encounter God. And it begins with you saying, I'm all in to this relationship for which I was made. Because no man can serve two masters. You will love one and despise the other. Lay aside the war within your soul. Put your treasure of your heart on the eternal perspective of Jesus and allow him to move as he continues to move in our midst and in the city around us today. So God, in this moment, help us to put on our perspective of you, to see the world as you see it. God, whatever you're asking us to do, I, I pray that we yield to you, that we lean into you. Father, move in our hearts, in our lives, and in our midst. Give us the courage to change. Give us the courage to become something so much more than we can ever even fathom right now. To lay aside our pain. To lay aside those other things that seem so important but ultimately will fade away. That were moths and thieves will take away and destroy and steal. And to press onward to a genuine, right, personal relationship with you. Simplify our heart even 